What's up, God's House? This is Pastor DJ, and I am away this weekend, but I want to introduce to you today the people who are going to be speaking to you and the people who I trust to bring you not only God's Word, but so much of their story that it will inspire you to live for Jesus in greater ways. This morning, we're starting a new series called Whatever It Takes, and all the next month, we're going to be looking at what it takes to be a follower of Jesus and the cost of being a disciple. This morning, you're going to hear from TJ, who leads our interns here at God's House, and Jamie, who's leading discipleship. And they're going to share some of their story and the times when they had to step out in faith to follow the leading of Christ in their life. So listen up to Anthony this morning as he interviews these two. And my hope and prayer is that today you will be inspired and challenged in your faith. Can't wait to see you guys next week. Well, good morning once again. So, um, so what we want to do is, uh, since TJ and Jamie, I almost always say TJ and DJ. I don't know why they go together. We're together but a lot. Yeah. I mean, I know you guys are together a lot. You guys, like, live next to each other. So, It's but, a strange codependency thing we have. I don't <laughs> know if it's correctable or not. But every time I tell somebody what we're doing, it's like, TJ, DJ. No, TJ, Jamie. So, uh, since they're so new, um, we want to uh, introduce them a little more and kind of give you a little background, a little story behind them, um, since, uh, since they are new. I was going to say since DJ didn't trust me to preach, but that wasn't the case. <laughs> it was a joke. <laughs> well, if he would have saw you five minutes ago, he'd let you preach every Sunday, right? Thank you. Uh, that was scary. Uh, Just so you know, and I had to face my fear. Like I couldn't be a hypocrite and tell my kids to face their fears and not face my own. So, Uh, so Jamie, I want to start out with you. Um, uh, Tell us something fun about who you are. Okay. Well, first, can I just say that my two and a half year old wouldn't go to the nursery this morning, so I was holding him throughout all of worship. So I'm a little winded. (laughs) Um, (laughs) That's why. Um, but my fun thing, um, I've been trying to decide between something fun and deep and something fun and silly. I chose fun and silly. So when I was in fifth grade, my science teacher, he told us, he would like start class with fun, random facts. And one day he said that it's impossible for anyone to ever lick their elbow. And I immediately was like, yeah, right, I can do that. So I did, and my class was like, wow, you're so weird, that's so weird. And people would, like, come up to me asking me to, asking to see me lick my elbow, and I would show them. So I'm not going to do it on stage, oh, but we, if you want to see. We can't see that? <laughs> oh, my Prove gosh. It. Do you want to see that? Okay. Do so, it. Do it. so weird. It. Okay. All right, it's really weird. <laughs> <laughs> so now you know. <laughs> I don't think I could do that. Um, I haven't met anyone else who can. And... No. <laughs> um, TJ, what about you? What, tell us something fun about you. I can't do that. But uh, I would say a um, weird fact about me is I told the first service, and it's still true, is I'm kind of a, a reluctant thrill seeker, which is the nicest way of saying I'm a full-on pushover. And in the group, of, the group of friends I grew up with, I can kind of get talked into doing not anything, but anything kind of crazy, like jumping into like class four rapids to swim because the life raft like guide said, like, you probably won't die. So my friends are like, yeah. And then probably. like cliff diving. <laughs> and then the most recent thing I did because of being just a total pushover is the day before I moved to Marion, I actually rode a bull. Now, this was, I mean, I'm 29 years old, and I thought I'd reached a point of like, hey, I've matured. I don't need to succumb to peer pressure anymore. But then my wife calls me as I'm getting to the bull riding place, and she's like, I'm pumped you're going to ride a bull. I'm like, yeah, actually, I'm not going to ride the bull today. She's like, that sucks, because I told all my work friends that you were going to ride a bull. (laughs) And they thought it was pretty cool. And I was like, yeah, well, and she's like, plus, I think it's kind of hot. And I was like... (laughs) I guess I'm riding the bull. <laughs> How could so, you not, right? Yeah, I mean, the one person I'm supposed to impress, apparently. So, yeah, I'm a pushover. <laughs> well, 
I think, I think, we'll, I think you and I would get along because I think let's do I want to do skydiving. So let's you do, it. do that. Yeah, yeah, let's right, do it. Right. My, the real thing I want to try, though, is have you ever seen those wind suits? Yes, space Yes, I so want to do that. You want to do that? Yeah. All right. All You'll right. have to, like I said, it's not hard. <laughs> um, okay, uh, Jamie, tell us about your journey in doing whatever it takes to follow Christ. Yeah, so when we were preparing for this service, um, Pastor DJ asked me to think about like the three, two or three main times in my life where I felt like God was calling me to something big enough that it would take, it would be whatever it takes to do it. And so I just want to share those three times with you this morning. Um, the first one was when I was graduating college. My, my husband and I got married a week later. And then three months after that, we moved to Georgia to become house parents at a children's home to a group of teen moms. Um, and that definitely, what, that took whatever it takes from us um, wow. to follow that call. Um, and then while we were there, a couple years into our time there, um, one of the moms from the, the house that we were house parents of aged out of care. And she had two, she had twin boys. And their placement that was lined up for them fell through. And so we found out that they would need a home like within a month. And we just really strongly felt like God was saying, you know, if these children need a home, you need to open up your home mm -hmm. to them. And so we did. Um, we had just found out we were pregnant with the, with the toddler I was carrying all morning. <laughs> um, and in January of, tw of 2014, February, we found out the twins needed a home and then March they moved in with us. Um, so that was a really big thing for us. Wow. Um, and then the third time I want to share with you is actually when we made the decision to move back here to Indiana um, just this past, right after Thanksgiving. Um, we really needed to spend a time healing um, in the nature of the work that we've done and the kids that we've brought into our home. We've experienced a lot of both firsthand and secondhand trauma. Um, and so God was just really calling us to just stop and come come back to our, our original community and um, heal. And that was really difficult for us because we're like in the thick of this call that we felt like we had on us. And it's, it's one thing to like do whatever it takes to go into ministry and do something that's not about yourself. But then when God's like, hey, take a break and do something for yourself right now. And like we didn't have jobs lined up or anything. So um, that was also really scary and difficult yeah. for us, but really necessary. Very scary. So you married, moved to Georgia, taken uh, to a home of children who need help. Is that me? Sounds like I'm opening a bottle of champagne. <laughs> um, then you take in a couple of other kids, and then you move back home. Wow. That's a lot. That, that is a lot. That. That takes a lot. Uh, well, thank you for doing whatever it takes. Thank you. That's, that's amazing. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, TJ, what about you? What, um, uh, tell us about uh, your journey and uh, what, it, what it's taken to follow Christ in your journey. Kind of like the same three, I, the three main points where I had it was, the first one was actually being called into ministry which happened in actually January of 2006 when I was 18. Because like most well-adjusted 18-year-olds, I had visions of being a rock star. Pretty practical, <laughs> right? Yeah, who does it? So I, uh, that was the plan. And I'd also kind of organized this plan that I didn't need the whole church thing anymore. Like I had grown up in church, seen it all, and I kind of realized like I kind of know all of it in this church thing because I'd kind of become a student of it. It's like if I get it all at 18, I guess I don't need it. Um, and so that's kind of the path I was on. And, uh, and also, I was kind of isolated because all my friends had moved to this random place that they called Iwu to go to school. <laughs> and uh, so I was in this weird place, but then I was invited to go to this uh, passion conference. It was being held in Nashville, Tennessee. And they're like, it's a week of pastors and worship leaders and all this kind of stuff. And I was like, that sounds awful. I'll pass. And so I got presented the day before they were getting ready to leave for that trip. And they were like, we really believe you should come. I was like, the conference is sold out. 
there's no way I shouldn't come. And the leader of that trip, who had been talking about it for months so excitedly, she's like, I will give you my ticket because I believe so strongly you should go. And so I went, and I was feeling guilty the whole way there because, like, well, what if she doesn't get to go, and I don't want to go, but I'm here. And within minutes of arriving at the conference, someone was, like, standing outside, like, does anybody want a free ticket? So she got to go, I got to go, I was like, maybe I should be here. And throughout the course of the week, I kind of reignited my love for God and my love for the church. And then the last thing, uh, this guy talked about passion and purpose, and I was like, yeah, I should totally do ministry. Like, that's my life calling. I get it. So I'm going to be in a Christian band, was my <laughs> line of thinking. Like I said, I was a well-adjusted 18-year-old. But then the next moment was, is I pursued that. But the next moment was several years later when God asked me to pursue pastoral ministry. And I remember the moment is I was on my way to work because I worked at a call center because the rock band thing didn't work out. <laughs> and he, I was listening to this sermon, and I asked God, I was like, what should I do with my life? And I felt in, like, my soul, God saying, I want you to do this. And I was devastated, absolutely devastated, to the point where I went into work, and I was like, hey, I can't work today because I'm sick. There's a belly thing, whatever I made up. It went out to my car and just <laughs> cried. And I just was sobbing there because I felt so much weight and so much pressure. And I was like, God, I can't do this. And I was really just throwing a tantrum. And finally, I was like, God, I'll do this, but you need to help me. And when I Amen. did, that weight lifted. Because it was one of those moments of God being like, yeah, I'm going to ask you to do things that are bigger than you. But yes. when you give it up, I'll take it. Yes. Um, and so that was a moment of just saying yes. yes. And then the, the third was after um, you guys have heard the story of the church in Pontiac closing. And I was just bummed and heartbroken because I would put my heart and soul into it. And then God tapped me on the shoulder and was like, hey, how about Marion? And I was like, I, I don't know. But we came and we went and we said yes. And it's turned out amazing. Awesome. Thank you. TJ, I said this to you in first service, but I'm going to say it again. Um, I think it's so cool how you'll step out in bravery with your friends to do something really crazy and adventurous and cool. Um, but I think it's even more amazing that you're stepping out in faith and in courage when the Lord asks you to do something for the sake of his kingdom. That you're well, thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Following Christ is scary, right? I mean, right? Yeah. Doing what Christ, yeah. trying to... It's scary if you do it. I mean, <laughs> if you don't do it, it's, it's scary. it will be scarier, yes. <laughs> um, okay, so have you, have you learned, how, I'm sorry, how have you learned to respond to what God asks you to do, Jamie? I've learned <clears throat> by <laughs> practicing hearing his voice, hearing God's voice. Um, my dad, when I was a kid and a teenager, he would, whenever I'd come up against something that I was unsure of or didn't know how to handle it or what to do next, he would just look me in the eyes and say, well, go pray about it, Jamie. You hear God's voice, go listen to him. And, um, I don't know if he was speaking that over me, like, or if he was seeing something in me that existed, but I believed him every time and I would go and um, just seek the Lord and, and listen to his voice. Um, and then even in ad adulthood, I've really tried to practice hearing his voice um, in the smaller things, smaller things. Um, so that way when he does say the big stuff to me, I know what his voice sounds like. And I'm not, I'm not unsure if it's him. Sometimes I'm unsure if, if I'm capable or ready, but yeah. I'm not unsure if it's him. That's awesome. Okay, so part B to that. Uh, how do you know that God, that it's God? Because, you know, I'm, and I say this for my benefit as well as everybody else, is, you know, uh, sometimes we're not, we're unsure. So how do you know? What do you do so you know you know? Yeah, um, that's a really good question. Um, there are two things that have that people have that people have said to me that have taught me a lot about recognizing God's voice. Um, one was several years ago. A friend of mine was like, "Hey, you know, we asked the Lord to come live inside of us, to come make make us 
his home. Um, and it makes sense that sometimes his voice would come from within us. I think sometimes it can be really scary to be like, is that just my thoughts or is that God? But he does, he speaks outside of us because he's outside of us too. And he speaks inside of us because he's inside yes. of us too. Um, so trusting, trusting that he's everywhere. <laughs> um, and then also a few weeks ago, Megan Gilmore in her sermon um, shared with us a story about her daughter asking how she could recognize God's voice. And Megan told her it's the voice that sounds like love. Mm. Um, and that has really stuck with me even in these last yes. few weeks since that sermon. Um, so yeah, it's the, it's the voice that sounds like love. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, TJ, um, how have you learned uh, to respond to what uh, God's voice or what he asked you to do? Uh, growing up, I was always taught to pray and that God like wanted to talk to us. Mm -hmm. um, and, that was, and that was a really exciting thing to me. So I think it was something I always tried to do, but then neglected as I got older. Yeah. And then when he started talking, you're like, whoa, what's, what's happening? And so I, what I found is it got easier to hear his voice when I started saying yes. Uh, yeah. Because yeah. if you would say something, I'd be like, ah, yeah, I've got this hunch, but like that just doesn't make sense. And then weeks later, I'd be like, God's not talking to me. I don't know what's going on. Why can't I figure out my life? Where is he at in this? But then when I say yes, then there's another thing. Then mm -hmm. there's another thing. So I think it's just the practice of saying yes. Yeah. I like that practice. Yeah. Well, it is. It's almost like a muscle. Like, and if yeah. you neglect it, it just totally atrophies and you lose it. Right, right. But if you're on it daily, like, when I'm on my game, like, I feel like I can hear God each day. But if other things start to matter so much, then it just kind of starts to disappear and I have to go find it again. Um, have you guys ever, give me an instance of where you've had either, you can, and you can choose either a great success or an epic fail of listening to God's voice. And you can choose. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just popped this one on them, so. I'll, uh, and I shared this in first service, and I'll stick with it, because I typically learn best from my failures, um, because they just tend to stick with me longer. And I, uh, I was driving through Pontiac, where we had started the church, and I, I was with my wife, Sarah, and I saw a guy on the side of the road, and he looked to be, like, homeless or in some situation similar, and he was in a wheelchair, and he was missing part of his lower leg. And when God speaks to me, he always does it through scripture. Like, it's always in verses, and I, I can learn to hear his voice that way. And he started speaking to me like a sledgehammer, the verse where Peter and John are on their way into the temple. And the beggar asks them for money, and their response to them is, silver or gold we do not have, but what we have, we give you in the name of Jesus' walk. And that verse started hitting me like crazy. I'm like, God, <laughs> I don't know if you noticed this, but the dude's missing part of his leg, so that's just silly. And so I kept driving, and he kept hammering me with this verse again and again and again. And so I finally got to where I was going, and I said to Sarah, like, we've got to go back. I don't know why. This is ridiculous. And I went back, and he was gone. And I was like, okay, I think maybe I missed something here, but that's just nuts. And then our other roommate at the time, had come back, and he's like, dude, I had the craziest thing happen to me today. He's like, I was driving through Pontiac. I saw this guy on the side of the road, and he was missing part of his leg, and God kept bringing this verse to my mind. I felt like he was telling me to stop and pray with this guy. I'm like, what in the world? And then we shared stories. We're like, well, that's still just silly. And then later on that day, out of the blue, my mom, who was at Bible college out in Colorado, sent me a video of a guy in Africa who was going through the tribes, and he met somebody who was missing part of their leg. He prayed for them, and they walked because God grew out the leg. And I was like, I don't know what would have happened, but I missed something. Mm -hmm. I honestly, really and truly, I do believe if I would have stepped out in faith, I would have seen a miracle. And I'd be like, yeah, it was awesome. It was fantastic. But now I carry with me, like, if I would have listened to the Holy Spirit, it, would have been, it could have been amazing. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. That's vulnerable. Jamie? Um, I'm going to share a, just a small story that's kind of a blend of the two, where it felt like kind of a failure, sort of, and then was also a success. Um, my freshman year of college, um, there was a girl who lived in the dorm next to mine. And one day, God just gave me a word of encouragement for her. I don't remember very much of the specifics of it. I remember it was about his great love for her and how much he wanted like a real present active relationship with her. But beyond that, I don't even really remember what it was. Um, and I wrote it out 
on a piece of paper, folded it up, and we had like little mailboxes next to our, each of our doors for little notes. So I stuck it in there for her on my way to my next class. And then we were friends, I, but she never said anything about it um, until almost a year later, she came to me and told me, like she had the note in her hand and told me like how much, like at first that note just, she was like, eh, you know, whatever, and like folded it up and put it away. But then as time went on, the Lord started using that word for her. And then it ended up just having a really profound impact on her and shifted the way that she knows God. Mm, that's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, how have you learned to trust? That's probably, that's probably what you just, we just, I just asked you, isn't it? Because... Practicing it, that's how you learn to trust it. Yeah, um, that's exactly what I was going to say. It's pra like practicing, um, working on my own obedience, mm. especially. Um, and the more that I'm obedient to the Lord, the, the more that builds, builds my own trust in him. Um, it's something that I have to offer one of my friends um, just recently shared with me that trust is something that I get to give. It's mine to give. Um, mm, that's a good way to look at it. Yeah. And yes, there's a quality of being trustworthy, mm -hmm. um, but there's also like, it's my choice to give my trust to the Lord or not. TJ, what about you? Um, I think like, like you had said, it's the practice of it. And the area I've had to practice it most is money. Mm -hmm. um, Cause if anybody's lying to you and saying, like, go into ministry, you'll be rich, it's not true. <laughs> um, and for me, there were so many moments where that got tested because I've had great job opportunities where I felt called into ministry and things were going, but it was going to be really time intensive. But then I'd be offered a job where they're like, yeah, most people who start here will make 80 grand in the first year and then move their way up. Mm. And I just, they're like, but we'll need you 70 to 80 hours a week. And there's part of like, well, that's fine. I can do that. But as I was leaving, I was like, I can't do that because that's only for money and then the struggle. And then having moments of within the time period not too long after that, me and Sarah both lost our jobs. The contract I was under for one job ended and then Sarah was doing in-home health care and the guy ended up passing away. So it just, mm -hmm. there was nothing there. And so we we're like, okay, God, where's this coming from? And there is a lot of like ego at play too because they tell you that like, your wife needs financial security and like Oprah and anybody who will talk on television says like if you don't provide that she's out and like oh my gosh that's terrifying and so like I go and pursue those different things and then find jobs where I end up having to go like clean toilets for some of my friends that I grew up mm. with who instead of pursuing min ministry pursued engineering and it's like what am I doing here and so we've just really had to learn to trust that God is the one who provides. And he does it in cool ways. When you take that step, even though they're like, hey, the math just doesn't work here. <laughs> like if you step out, there's cool ways that he comes through, like whether it be like a random cleaning job or even there were times where we were like short on rent by like a hundred bucks and we're a day away and we're like, we just don't know how this is going to work. And I got a phone call from a friend. He's like, hey, I work for this company. We need you to do a survey and we'll give you a hundred dollar gift card. Like God. God just awesome. comes through when you step out. He yeah. honors that. Yes. And then he does relieve and give you positions where you're not constantly stressed. But you have to be willing to step out and test and see that he's good. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Um, so, Jamie, are you glad that you did listen to the voice and listen to God's voice? Yes, absolutely. I'm glad. Um, it's been difficult and... There have been a lot of things that have that I've experienced that are just crushing and incredibly heartbreaking, um, and have experienced so much grief. Um, but yes, absolutely, I think even still, even in the midst and smack dab in the middle of those difficult things, um, God's grace is so abundant, and there is so much beauty and so much joy. Um, yeah, I wouldn't change it. TJ? Uh, sorry, what was your question? Are, are, are you <laughs> glad that you um, have listened to God's voice through yeah, all of this? For journey? sure, most definitely. I mean, it's, um, it's one of those things that God says you can judge something by the fruit, and we can judge him by his fruit. Right. 
yes. when we step out, he really provides blessings. And I do have, um, and this is just me comparing my life to some friends who've made other choices, whether it be engineering, and there's way more money, way my, nicer houses, a lot more success early on. But I wouldn't trade what I get to do for the world. Because um, yeah. I get to be a yeah. part of moments and see people's lives change and they get excited and they have these new ideas about God and who he is. It's like, yeah, that is worth everything. Like, I'll be broke again. It doesn't matter. Those moments are so worth it because you, you get to see lives change. And there's, I don't know, I wouldn't trade it for anything. Awesome. Um, so yesterday... Um, if you didn't come, you should have come, but you can come next year. There was an exalt conference, and one of the um, gentlemen speaking, um, his name's Phil Vischer, and uh, he talked about a dream that he had, and his dream was uh, Big Idea Productions, Veggie Tales. Um, and so, and he talked about, um, he had to sacrifice that dream. Um, when, you know, things happen and that dream had to be sacrificed. Have you guys, what have you guys uh, had to sacrifice in your journey and following God's voice and, and listening to God? Jamie? There have been several things to follow, like to answer and follow God's callings um, that I've had to sacrifice. Um, and each time it's really just a sense of comfort and safety um, but as you asked the question that way just now, Anthony, I was thinking about um, specifically leaving the ministry that my husband and I were at in Georgia to come back here um, and it feeling like this, call, this calling or this thing that we had been called to do was ending and confused about why and confused about the way that it was happening. Um, and so in that I really had to sacrifice this idea that um, that I'm something so big and important in in the lives of the kids at Hepzibah or in the staff at Hepzibah that if I leave, like it's gonna crumble. Um, so I had to I had to sacrifice that idea of myself and just humble myself before the Lord. Thank you, TJ. What about you? Mine was similar in the sense of it was continually pride. Okay. Because um, from everything from being the, the very goofy 18-year-old who just had these ideas of grandeur and all that kind of stuff to <laughs> going into the ministry to even just being willing to be broke and pursuing what God asked you to do and doing things like cleaning the houses of your friends and then um, going into Pontiac and doing a church there, which honestly didn't make sense. Yeah. Um, and then getting questions by, like, at the time, Pontiac was on the list of the 100 most dangerous cities in the U.S. And people being like, cool, so how come you don't want to protect your wife? And, <laughs> like, it's just like, oh, yeah, maybe I should. Um, but God protected us there. But then um, you guys have heard this story of the church in Pontiac eventually closing because DJ had shared that. And I was heavily, heavily involved in that in moments of just feeling kind of crushed by it because you promote it, you put everything into it, and you want everybody to know about it, but then everybody sees it when it falls apart. Mm, yeah. And I was kind of sitting in a moment of just self-pity, honestly, and then God tapped me on the shoulder, and he's like, hey, how about Marion? And mm. like, okay, yeah, we prayed about it, we decided to do it, and then we tell those same people who are asking us questions like, why go to Pontiac? And then they ask questions like, well, what if that church fails? Yeah. And like, oh, yeah, thanks for bringing that up yeah. again. Um, which obviously Twist it's not because you guys are incredible. They don't know what Amen. they're talking about. Amen. Um, but there's moments of surrendering your pride because you have to just kind of lay that down in effort to follow what God asked you to do. Right, absolutely, absolutely. Thank you, both of you. Okay, um, the last thing. What is one piece of advice uh, that you would like to leave us uh, and let us um, that has carried you through following Christ um, you're capable of hearing God's voice you're capable of knowing and recognizing his voice just like you would recognize 
your best friend's voice or your husband or wife's voice or your parents' voices. You're capable of recognizing his voice. So I just want to encourage you to practice that. Practice being quiet long enough Mm, to hear him. Practice getting into his word and learning how he has shown up consistently throughout all time so you know him. Thank you. TJ, what about you? I would say um, the scripture says, I will never leave you or forsake you. And God will ask you to do things that seem way bigger than what you can handle. And when he does that, he will not leave you or forsake you. Amen. And then it has kind of like a part B to that. It's okay to do that and pursue that and be totally freaked out and totally afraid. Yes. You don't have to be filled with faith and ready to go because it's awesome. <laughs> you can be scared out of your mind just being like, Jesus, you're going to be there, right? And step out and go for it because it will be scary and it will seem way bigger than you can tackle. Yes. But then he shows up and you're like, wow, I'm glad I did this because I wouldn't have wanted to miss this. Yes, amen. Well, thank you guys for sharing your hearts and your wisdom um, and reminding us that uh, hearing God's voice isn't uh, something necessarily that's super spiritual that only a few uh, get to hear his voice, but it takes, like with anything else, like with our relationship with Christ, it takes practice. It takes work. Uh, It takes being quiet. And it takes us kind of humbling ourselves and setting aside our pride to hear from God. So, thank you guys. I appreciate you guys laying it out there for us. Thank you. Thank you. Julian is gonna. Uh, Julian is going to come out and um, close us out. This great young man. I love this bro. Love you, man. Awesome, awesome. Guys, thank you for being here. Um, Thank you for just coming to worship with us and just to hear, you know, what God has. Um, Just just one piece to leave with you. Um, Your testimony is just as strong as everyone else's, okay? So feel free. Share your story with somebody this week. Um, Share what God has done in your life this week. Um, it blesses people. Um, I've been blessed by listening to their stories. And so that's, that's what it does. When we share our stories and we share where we've been, um, it not only blesses you, but it blesses someone else. So do that this week. Be encouraged. Um, if you would stand with me, and we are going to confess the blessing that our best and most blessed days are ahead of us. Listen, if you guys need prayer for anything, there are going to be prayer warriors down here to pray with you. If you want to um, be a partner, again, we have partnership in the back. Um, connect with people, be in community. I love you guys and have a blessed week. All right.